Hi everyone and welcome to Creating, Editing and Printing Black and White Fine Art Prints sponsored by Ilford. And our thanks to the folks at Ilford for, for uh, sponsoring this. My name is Joe Brady, I'm going to be your host today. And I've really enjoyed putting this together. I learned a lot during the process and I uh, hope to share a lot of this with you. Now, I'm here today to talk about specifically black and white conversions and printing. I'm going to be using some of Ilford's new fine art papers including some of my favorites Gold Cotton Textured, Fine Art Smooth, and of course, the new Gold Mono Silk. However, before we get into the tips and techniques of the conversion process and how to create the best black and white file to print, let's explore some of the whys about choosing to print in black and white in the first place. Now, black and white prints have a very different feel and mood to them compared to their color counterparts. When shape and tone are more important than the color in an image, they can be made much more dramatic without worrying about what tonal adjustments will do to color in an image. Black and white prints also provide for a lot of versatility. Practically any type of photograph is well suited to black and white, whether it be portraits, landscapes, still life, or architecture. For decorative images, it also has the marketable advantage of fitting in with any decor. So if you're looking to sell your prints, it's always something that's going to fit in with the decoration. Certain colors or combinations of colors can be a distraction. Now while color in some images is critical, it can be distracting in others. Black and white also can exhibit great beauty when there are many subtle tones in the image. This may be hidden or overshadowed sometimes by color. Of course, ultimately the choice is yours and experience will direct you to the types of images that may have more impact or at least a very different mood or vibe when converted to black and white. I personally find that both high key and low key images work particularly well in black and white. And just for those terms, if you're not familiar with it, high key, the image has a very light mood to it, like this portrait here. Low key, again, a portrait here that's in low key, as is this landscape. I also look for scenes that are lacking great color, but might have skies that offer drama and shape. Now this frequently happens on stormy days. And after you've had some experience with the conversion techniques, you'll learn to see what types of scenes are going to respond dramatically in the software. Now, just one quick word about appropriate printers for fine art black and white printing. Many of today's printers are very capable of producing beautiful black and white prints. Now, again, me personally, I use an Epson Stylus Pro 2880 and a Canon IPF 6350. One thing these two printers share is that they have multiple black and gray ink cartridges. Having a black ink along with two shades of gray allows you to produce very smooth gradations from light to dark. Now, if you've got a printer that only has one black ink cartridge, it's not going to produce the kind of quality black and white prints we're after. So let's continue on. I want to talk about the papers a bit. Then I'm going to show you a handful of black and white conversions that you can do in Photoshop. Now, the paper you use for your black and white printing is going to have an enormous impact on the look and feel of the print. While you can print this type of image on practically any type of paper, I like five papers for my black and white printing. Now you of course may find another paper you prefer, but let me explain how I arrived at my current favorites. Now the first is Ilford's new gold mono silk. I got a box of it right here. This is the gold mono silk paper. Now this paper was specifically designed for black and white printing. And how they did that was uh, some of the papers have a layer in it called the burrito layer, which is a basically a clay coating uh, that makes colors pop. This layer was left out in this particular paper. Now you could still actually print color images on this paper, but the colors will appear more subdued. The beauty of gold mono silk is its incredible depth and smoothness. The blacks to creamy whites resemble traditional darkroom prints in their look and feel. Now for, again, for my personal taste, I find this paper excels when there's a lot of depth to the image. The deep shadows and blacks in low key images are intense. In fact, I'm going to just grab this image here. I was fortunate to photograph some Cirque du Soleil performers. And the black on here is just incredible. Uh, really hard to get this on pretty much any other kind of paper. Uh, the smooth gradations are just unmatched. Now, as my uh, friend Rick Salmon likes to say, light illuminates and shadows define. And this particular paper, produces the most defining shadows I've ever seen in an inkjet paper surface. One little side note, but an important one, I just discovered this the other day. It helps to know what type of lighting will illuminate your print. The gold mono silk, silk's mid-grays 
will reflect under standard fluorescent tubes a bit of a greenish cast. And that's because standard fluorescent tubes have a strong green spike in their spectrum. Your eyes don't see it, but the paper and the ink will. Now under daylight or full spectrum fluorescent lights or tungsten lights, this effect goes away completely and the print shows completely neutral. If your print absolutely has to be displayed under these terrible types of lights, you're either going to have to add a slight bit of magenta to the mid-tones or you're going to need to choose another paper. However, if any of you run into this, I can send you directions on how to counter this effect, but really the best option is to display your prints under good lighting. That means at the very least good tungsten lamps and at the best full daylight spectrum UV filtered lights. Now the next papers are two heavyweight fine art papers that are identical except for their surface texture. This is gold cotton textured and gold cotton smooth. Again, two of my favorite papers. Both of these papers have sort of a, a kind of a creamy, slightly gold tone to them, uh, which for me really works well in landscape and portrait images. In fact, these papers might be my single favorite surface for black and white landscape work. They are 330 gram per square meter papers. Well, what does that mean? Kind of hard to translate uh, through the video here, but what I can tell you is they are extremely heavy papers. They don't buckle at all and they can take a huge amount of ink coverage and there's not going to be any buckling. So that's a real big advantage for this kind of paper when you've got something with a lot of ink. Lastly, two lighter weight fine art papers. Ilford's new Fine Art Smooth and Fine Art Textured. And I've got boxes of those here as well. Again, these are lighter weight papers. These are 220 gram per square meter papers. And again, you'd have to actually touch the papers to really get a sense of what that means. They're still fairly heavy papers, but not as heavy as the gold cotton papers. They're a little bit brighter white point, a little bit more of a neutral color. So if an absolute neutral gray is what you're after, you might prefer these papers. This particular uh, portrait right here was done on the uh, fine art textured. Now to find your favorite paper, I'd suggest trying out a sample pack of the fine art papers and decide for yourself. Now also, to get the best print results, you've got to know about preparing your images for black and white. To do this, it will be very handy to explore some options for black and white conversion in software. Now because of the control possible using layers and masks, I prefer doing this in Photoshop rather than in Lightroom. So we're going to start by taking a closer look at some basic black and white conversion techniques. These are going to include the very simple convert to grayscale a use saturation adjustment layer, also very simple. Now these first two are limited in their use. Then we're going to move on to a double use saturation adjustment layer, which will give you a lot more flexibility. Converting to lab color and just using certain of the channels there, and then using the gradient map. Let me show you these options, then we'll come back and we'll explore a few more. Now just like with every other operation you might do in Photoshop, there are many ways to accomplish similar ends. So what I'm going to do is go through some of the grayscale conversions. I'm going to start with some of the simple ones and move on to the more complex ones. As, and as expected, the more complex ones are going to give you more control over your conversion. So let's start with a few of the simple ones and we'll start right with just really convert to grayscale. So if you go up to image mode and change it to grayscale, it's going to tell you now um, you're going to discard a lot of information and you don't have any control of how it's done. You just All you've done is uh, gotten rid of everything and converted it to a gray. In some cases it may work, in other cases it may not. Now there are things you can do from here. Uh, let's just try something real quick. I'm going to take this layer and duplicate it. You can do this two ways. I can either drag it down to the folded page here or I could hit Command or Control J on a PC. Then I'll change the blending mode from normal to overlay which is going to add a lot more contrast to it and in this case I'll just bring the contrast down and then I can turn this layer on and off and we can see what it's done and it's actually not too shabby a black and white conversion so the convert to grayscale by itself is generally going to be pretty weak it's going to require a little bit more uh, adjustments after the fact and this duplicating of the layer and changing it either to an overlay or for a little bit softer effect going to the soft light uh, will actually make a pretty nice black and white conversion. You can see once again we went from there to there adds a little more pop to the image. However it's still limited. So I'm going to just go back into my history here and we're going to go back to our color image 
and let's try something else. And the next one is going to be a non-destructive hue saturation adjustment layer. So I'll click on my adjustment layers down here in the lower right and go to hue saturation. Now again, simply I could just take the saturation and turn it all the way down. Well, in this case, hmm, doesn't do a very good job because it's just completely destroyed the tonal range of the flowers here. But this is generally one, really, honestly, you're probably never going to do it this way. However, use saturation is not a total loss because what we could do is add a use saturation adjustment layer. And what we're going to do is change the blending mode on this one to color. Just hold on to that thought for a second because we're now we're going to make a second one. So I'm going to go to use saturation again and on this one I am going to pull out all of the saturation which gets us back to that ugly spot we were in before. However, if I go and click on our first one that we change the blending mode to color and then change the hue here, take a look and see what happens. Since I'm adjusting the hue of the image, you can see I get a very different response depending on where the U lands. And obviously if I go into yellow, whatever color I make my U, that color is going to start to get much lighter. So as I go to yellow, the sunflowers start to reappear. And the blues, which are almost we're opposite of that, start to get darker. So actually in that case, hueing a, doing a double hue saturation adjustment layer isn't too shabby. And again, without that second one, without that one adjusted to color, this process doesn't work very well. So again, let's back up and let's try something completely different. This time we're going to do a conversion from RGB into lab color. And you do that under image mode lab color. And you don't see anything really change. You do see a big change in the histogram. However, if you look at the channels, you'll see RGB are now gone. Now we have a lightness channel and the colors are in these two channels called A and B. If we turn those two off, you see you do have a black and white. And sometimes that particular channel all by itself will actually do a pretty good job of a black and white conversion. In this case, I think the sky is too light. But what we could do now is right from here, convert this to grayscale discard the A and B color information and in this case when we do the conversion it does come out a little bit darker. Now if we back up we have another option and what we could also do is just take this one channel just do a select all and copy it open up a new document and by the way after you copy something the new document will have exactly the pixel dimensions of whatever it is you copy to the clipboard and I'm just gonna call it uh, I'm just gonna call it paste for now and do a command V to paste it and there is just the uh, lightness channel put in there and again I could do the same thing if I wanted to add a little more drama to the sky I could duplicate go back to my layers I can duplicate that layer change it to overlay and bring down the opacity somewhat and see if that gives me the image I'm after Again, a very different look than what we did with our use saturation. This will work with some images and not with others. Okay, we're back at our RB, RGB image. What would be the next one we might want to try? And I'm going to do something else that's very interesting that creates great black and whites that give you a lot of control. And that is also underneath your adjustment layers and it's called the gradient map. And if you set the gradient to one of the preset defaults, like black and white, if you choose a color, you're going to get something weird like that. Just choose the black and white gradient. And what you can do while you have the gradient editor open is you can adjust these sliders as to where black and white are going to move. So you can see as I move that over, that makes the white come much more in. If I bring the black over, it darkens the overall image. You can also add intermediate point. This is where I want, say, like a mid-gray and then I can tell it where is mid gray going to go and you can see now you've got a lot of control here same thing here if I want to adjust this black to be something say in there so what you've got here is a way to make some more fine-tuned controls over your black and white and this can create stunning black and white it takes a little bit of practice and you can see what we're doing is changing different tones here uh, you could make it colors as well, which is going to be weird, but it's an option. So let me close this, and you can see doing that gradient map adjustment 
did a very nice job of creating a black and white. So this is one you're probably going to want to have in your toolkit, and probably the first one uh, of the uh, the last grouping that you might want to consider uh, becoming a standard way that you're going to look at black and white conversions. All right, uh, you guys are very active in the chat room. That's good. That's a good thing, and thank you for the questions. Um, there's a couple of them that are coming through uh, that are very technical specification kind of things. And what I'll really do is I'll direct you to Ilford.com for that. Just go to the individual paper and you can read all the specification type of stuff on there. Uh, somebody asked an interesting question about creating an ICC profile for the gold monosilk paper. As I mentioned, it does still print colors. It's just a more of a, of a subdued color. So what I would suggest doing is do a profile like you normally would. Print out the color charts and do that. Uh, it depends you know, what you're using to create your profile. For example, if you're using the Color Monkey photo, You'd go through the two standard color sheets. Then in the software what you can do is you can add another image. And what I do for my black and white papers is I created in Photoshop a 20 step gray wedge that goes from white to black in Photoshop that I can then add in to refine a profile. That will further refine the tonal curve of the black and white papers. Um, if, that, if you need more information than that, then send me a note, send me an email. We'll give you an email address when we do our email follow-up. Uh, someone asked, does a gold mono work with RIP printing? Meaning, if you don't know what a RIP is, you don't need it. But a RIP is a raster image processor. Uh, yes, you just need the profile for it. And all of the profiles for all of these papers, if you don't create your own, are also available from ilford.com. Just click on the individual papers, and you'll see all the profiles there waiting. Uh, another question was, Somebody asked about OBAs, which are optical brightening agents, and which of these papers do or do not have them. Excellent question. Optical brighteners are coatings that are put in the paper to make it appear brighter. Uh, they typically add a little bit of blue. There's good and bad to it. One, they make the surface look whiter. The bad is if they're exposed to a lot of UV light, they will eventually burn out, and that's going to cause a change in the paper. It will revert back to its natural surface. Gold mono silk has no optical brighteners, so no worries there. Oh, and someone else asked about the surface for this paper. Uh, this is a semi-gloss surface, so it would use um, the photo ink rather than the matte ink in your printer if you have to switch back and forth. On the fine art papers and the gold cotton papers, the gold cotton papers uh, do not have optical brighteners in them. They have that kind of natural, slightly gold, hence the name, uh, tone to them, so they do not have optical brighteners in them. The fine art papers, however, do have a small amount of optical brightener in it. Uh, that's to give it that extra white, extra neutral look. So if you're concerned about keeping that completely neutral look over time, uh, you either need to use uh, UV glass uh, when you're having it framed, or you're going to have to have a UV coating on it. Otherwise, you might have a slight change in sort of the temperature of the surface over time. Let me just see if there's any other questions that are appropriate. Uh, someone asked about the difference between the Epson 3880 and the 2880 that I'm using. Uh, other than a larger size printer, they use the same exact ink chemistry, so everything would apply. Uh, let's see. So again, for the fine art papers and the gold cotton papers, you would use a matte ink. So for example, on my 2880, I have to switch cartridges, very annoying. Uh, on my Canon 6350, it has both the matte and the photo black loaded in at the same time, and depending on which profile is chosen, it automatically switches in the printer. Much easier way to do it. Uh, so somebody asks, are these papers available in rolls for wide format printers? And the answer is yes. Uh, the Canon that I use is a 24-inch printer, and I have all of these papers on rolls. So let's move on and, and get a little more into some more advanced conversion techniques. Now these are going to be done using two more adjustment layers the channel mixer, and the aptly named black and white adjustment layer. These are generally the two ways I do most of my conversions in Photoshop. Now after these, we'll explore my favorite black and white conversion filter plugin. First, let's take a closer look at these two additional methods, the channel mixer and the black and white adjustment layer. Now the last two more advanced controls that I want to show you are the channel mixer and using a black and white adjustment layer. So let's take a look at channel mixer first. Again, it's an adjustment layer underneath the little uh, folded half circle there. So we just go to channel mixer. And again, channel mixer can look a little bit daunting, but there are some presets in here. So if you want to see 
what one of these presets looks like. If you've ever had any experience with black and white photography, you know that putting a yellow, orange, or red filter will make your blues, your skies, get much darker. Let's choose the intermediate. Let's choose orange. And you can see you get a decent black and white. Let's try red, which will make it even a little more dramatic. And that creates, in this case, a really really nice black and white. Now what you want to be careful of is you want the numbers of your red, green, and blue to add up to close to 100. And you can see we've got 128 here, not going to work. So let me put the blue back to zero for a second here. You can also make one over and another one less to compromise for that. So for example, if I bring up my red to 120, I could also take red, green and blue down to make up for that. So let's say if I just take blue and make it minus 20, it makes it even more dramatic. It's getting borderline infrared at that point. Or I could take maybe take it down oh, 9 or 10, and I'll bring down green also, about the same amount. And you can see it always gives you the number on the bottom as to what your total is. And I'm starting to get a little bit of grungy, particularly up in the sky. So generally I find that uh, sticking to 100 or less is going to give you the best result. If you find you're always using the same combination, you can save a channel mixer preset. So say, for example, you like, oh, let's say 70 and 10 and 20. Say that's a, a number you like for conversions, you can do that. In this case, it doesn't work particularly well because we lost the yellow of the flowers. So let's make the blue 10. Let's make the green 20, and we'll leave the red at 70. And again, as long as we stick to this somewhere near 100 on our total, it's going to give us a nice result. So you could save this. This is kind of a mid-contrast tone. So what I'm going to do is save this. I'll just save it in here. I'll call it mid-contrast. I'll put it in my channel mixer presets, click on save, and now you see it shows up in your list. Let's take a look, as long as we're here, let's take a look and see what it does with infrared, which, as expected, makes the greens way too light. I think in this one, probably the red filter is going to give us the best black and white of this sunflower field. The sky has gone nice and dark, and the flowers are pretty cool. So that's the channel mixer. Let's turn that one off, and let's take a look at the black and white adjustment filter. So we click on black and white adjustment layer, and to me this is a, a kind of a much more useful one. Now we go to preset, you'll see a lot of similar ones. In fact, we have the red and yellow here. You can see there's our red, it's, even, it's a much deeper red. We've got a yellow filter here, which also works. But let me put it back, a green filter, by the way, is going to be probably the most mid-range. But what we have now is a targeted adjustment layer, a targeted adjustment tool, rather, right here, the finger pointy thing. And what we can do is click on that. It gives us the eyedropper, but it's not really to sample a color. If we drag it left and right, it makes that color lighter or darker. So if we want that blue sky to get dark, and we also want the greens to stay a little bit dark, because we don't want it to compete with our flowers. Then we come up into our flowers themselves, drag to the right, and now just the flowers get that white back. I'm going to take the blue sky down even a little more over here. I'm going to bring the green leaves down, and I'm going to make the yellow petals even whiter. And that quickly, we got a lot of control out of this image using the black and white adjustment filter. And again, you can save this as a black and white preset, and I'll call it uh, high contrast for, ye for a yellow subject, which in this case was our flowers. So I'll save that, and you can see now in our presets, there it is. So you can then go and experiment around if you want to see high contrast red filter, kind of freaky, but I can always just go right back to my setting. And that is the black and white uh, adjustment layer filter. All right, a couple more uh, interesting questions, and a couple of you are asking about a paper that I wasn't planning on talking today about, except at the very end, but let's address it now. And that's where does gold fiber silk fit into this mix here? Gold fiber silk is also a heavyweight paper. Uh, yes, it could also be considered a fine art paper. It's a surface that would be more akin to what you're used to seeing with a luster paper. It's kind of got that gloss surface to it, 
but with the structure to it so that it does diffuse light a little bit. Uh, I do like using that paper rather than a glossy paper. Uh, some of you mentioned that it's your favorite black and white paper. Uh, you like that luster surface. And again, it's a very subjective thing. Uh, I have found that I like these. But again, you've got to try them out to find out. Uh, somebody mentioned they do really like the gold mono silk, like we have over here, uh, for these kind of images. But it is glossy. And that is true. Uh, if I do hold this up into the light, you know, I can hold it, angle it the, right, the wrong way. And you can see it does have a glare to it. So if you are going to put this under lights or behind glass, you're going to have to either use a non-glare glass or spray it ahead of time. Somebody asked about, can you spray it? And the answer is absolutely yes, you can. You can just spray it with a matte UV coating, and that glossiness will go away. Uh, let's see. Somebody asked about archival quality. All of these papers are considered archival. Now, again, that assumes under normal viewing conditions. If you leave it, as I always say, on the dashboard of your car on a sunny August day, yes, it's going to fade. But under normal viewing conditions, these are all archival. They'll probably last longer than any of us will. They're all good for hundreds, hundreds of years. Uh, lastly, anything else? Somebody asked, are any of these papers available in a true matte finish? The four uh, fine art papers that I mentioned are completely matte. For example, let me, let me bring up another smaller print here. So here's one. This is uh, actually the Tappan Zee Bridge at night. A commuter's nightmare during the morning, but pretty at night. And you can see, as I angle this away and, and towards the light, there is no glare on this at all. It is a completely matte surface. The only thing that happens is it gets brighter if I move closer to our studio lights. But other than that, no glare, no reflectance at all. That would be even more so for the textured papers. Uh, if you go into the... Uh, cotton textured stock, because of the surface that diffuses light even more, uh, it's even, if you can possibly have something even more matte, then that would be the answer. Here, for example, here's uh, an image I did in Death Valley at the racetrack. And you can see as I rotate this, there's absolutely no glare other than it gets, of course, brighter as I go closer to our studio lights. So these are really true matte surfaces. They don't require any coating to get rid of that glare. Uh, let's see, anything else before we continue? Oh, somebody asked about, uh, oh, I did already mention about the wide format printers. Yes, archival, true matte, gold fiber silk. We'll go back to gold fiber silk a little bit later. But again, if you like a luster surface, then definitely gold fiber silk is the way to go. Uh, me personally, I like the dark room look of the gold mono silk, and I'm a huge fan of the matte fine art papers. So let's continue on. We've, we've seen a bunch of Photoshop conversions. So next, my favorite black and white conversion plugin, Nick's Silver Effects Pro 2. Now you might have known Nick is now part of Google, and one of the advantages to all of us is they've now made the complete Nick plugin collection available at a price less than some of the individual filters cost alone just a few months ago. And I'll even sweeten the pie a little more by giving you my Nick code to get another 15% off. Now, while I almost always bring any image I plan on converting to black and white into silver effects, I often still use some of the Photoshop techniques that we've just seen before going into this filter. The reason for that, and this is my workflow, I find this seems to give me more control to get the light shaped exactly the way I want. Now, this is my personal preference. So explore the options yourself, and you'll find the workflow that makes the most sense to you. So let's take a look at black and white conversion using Nick's Silver Effects Pro 2. The last black and white conversion I'm going to cover is going to be using Nick Software's Silver Effects Pro 2. Now I know there are other companies that make black and white conversion uh, softwares. I've used some of them, uh, particularly uh, Topaz has a new one out, as does On One, and I plan on trying them both shortly. However, I really love Silver Effects Pro 2, so let's go into that. Now I took this image thinking Nick Silver Effects right from the second I took it. It was a very flat scene. Uh, we've got some storm going over. This is Jackson Lake and the Grand Tetons. But really what I was looking at with this sky, I know from using the software that it was going to make this sky look extremely dramatic and turn a somewhat humdrum scene into a really dramatic image. So let's go into Silver Effects. So I'm going to go to Filter, Nick Collection, Silver Effects Pro 2.
Okay, so the standard conversion again is pretty basic. I've got this divider here. I'm just going to move it off to the side for now. And you can look along the left hand side and there are presets. And you can scroll down along and see maybe you can get a feeling of, of what's going to work. And I can see some here that are looking good. Let's click on this high structure one and see what that does to our image. It's starting to get there. Let's continue down a little more. See if there's any other processing defaults that we like. And up, oh, I think I might see one. Here's one called Full Dynamic Range Harsh. Let's take a look at that one. And I like what that's doing as well. So I think that's the one I'm going to go with. There are many more, and you can explore these on your own. By the way, you can download this uh, full package for a 15-day full trial. And one thing I always go to when I have a landscape is structure. And structure adjusts the contrast of kind of localized areas. So I'm going to add a lot of structure to this. And let's draw it to the global image. And let's take a look and see what happens. And look already where we've gotten. Now I'm going to bring up the brightness just a little bit. Bring up the contrast a little more. I think I made it a little brighter than I wanted. Just a little bit. And already that quickly... Look what we've done, and look at that sky. And if I drag the slider, the before and after slider over, you can see we went from that to that. I mean, it's an incredible, dramatic difference. And one of the other beauties of all the Nick softwares is the control point technology that's in here. So if I want to then further define this, I can do that. So I want to make this upper right-hand corner a little more dramatic. So I'm going to click a control point here. Uh, this top slider allows me to adjust the area of influence that this particular control point is going to have. And if I click and drag it left and right, you can see it makes it bigger and smaller. And I'm going to add some more structure to in here, even to bring it out a little more. I'm also going to darken it a little bit. I want this upper right hand to be a little darker. And I'm going to add more contrast to it to start to bring out some of the whites. Very good. So let's add a couple more. I'm going to add another one in the mountains. I want to bring out the structure here a little more to define some of the snow on the peaks. I might brighten that up a little bit as well. Just a little bit. So what I'm also doing is I want to focus the viewer's eyes kind of towards the center where these real dramatic clouds are. And to do that, I'm going to darken things towards the edge of the slide. So I'm going to do the same thing up here. I'm going to click on this upper right-hand corner. I'm going to bring the brightness down a little bit here. And again, the beauty is that this will bring down whites, uh, which is something you can't do with a simple levels command in Photoshop. Same thing down here. I'm just going to bring the brights of these corners down a little bit. Yes, there are vignetting techniques in here as well. And I'm going to open up this middle a little bit. I'm going to increase the contrast and increase the structure a little bit more, just to get that very dramatic. And lastly, to lead you into the center, I'm going to put one right in the middle here in the water. Open up the brightness a little bit there. By the way, if you're curious, down below here, you can take a look and see that uh, what is the mask, what effect is that particular point having. And you can turn them on and off and take a look to see what area has been affected. Unfortunately, as of yet, you cannot export these uh, as layer masks, which would be really nice. One of my other favorite things about this software is the ability to add a grain that is extremely film-like. Now there is a whole bunch of presets for all kinds of different black and white films that you can scroll through and try out. Uh, I happen to be a big fan. I'm going to undo that one. I'm bringing my grain in the upper 300s, between 350 and 370. And if I zoom in... And you can see, and now that it's rendered, you can see now we've got this beautiful grain that is extremely film-like. Yes, there are grain uh, filters now. You can add grain actually in Photoshop, but it still doesn't do the film-like grain that Silver Effects Pro does. And one of the beauties of this is if you've got a sky that starts to get a little grungy because of all your adjustments, uh, the grain will break that up and it'll make it look great. So let me toggle off my zoom. We can back off and see the entire image. And again, if I show this before and after, look at the dramatic black and white we've been able to produce here and have control of it. I did mention there are toning options here. Uh, I'm not going to go into that in this detail, but if I wanted to add, make of it more of a sepia, I can do that. Uh, if I wanted to add a vignette, you can do that here as well. I could turn the vignette on. You can add frames. You can put built-in lens fall-offs, etc. 
lots of different options here. Uh, take a look at the program, download it. You know, like I mentioned, you can download it for 15 days for free. So I'm just going to hit OK, and it's going to take everything that we've done and add it to our Photoshop layer. And we'll get to see what a dramatic difference that SilverFX Pro makes on this image. And quite the difference from, there's our previous layer, and here's our Silver Effects effect. So after having my Silver Effects layer, you can do anything you do in Photoshop. Now I decided I wanted to adjust the curves a little bit. I just also decided that this dramatic scene would look better on a black background than on a white. I also added some text to it, so let me just throw all my Photoshop adjustment layers on here so you can see what my final image looked like. And here's the final image, and it really created a very dramatic scene when you compare this to that. Quite the difference, huh? So there's some of the beauty, some that you will learn uh, when you're taking a look at scenes. You'll learn what these softwares can do and what you can do to get the, the best black and white image possible. So now that we've done our edits, we've gone through all kinds of different conversions. The next step will be to take a look at just making sure we've got our profile selected and we've chosen the right, the, not the right, but we've chosen the best paper for the image. A few more questions before we get close to uh, finishing up. Someone asked again, what was the paper that was used for the racetrack photograph? Again, here it is. Uh, this is the gold cotton textured, my single favorite paper for landscape images. I love the tone of it. I love uh, just kind of the whole vibe of the paper. And yes, it is a heavy paper. You can see I can hold it out here and just with a slight bend in it and it just stays out there. Uh, phenomenal paper. Once you feel this paper and you see it coming out of the printer, you hand this image to a customer and they know that they're getting a really super high quality paper print and paper. One of the beauties of having a paper this heavy is that you can have these bends to it and do things like this and you never get any of those little creases in this paper. That's why I love this. Someone asked about using um, smooth high gloss and as I mentioned earlier you can print black and white on any paper you like. It all depends on the vibe you're going for. Try a sample pack if you want to explore. Smooth high gloss, actually, I don't even really consider it a paper. It's actually almost like a plastic. It is so shiny. It has its uses, so give it a try. Um, someone asked about ink usage. Of course, that's going to vary a lot depending on the print. Uh, I picked out this one. This is probably the heaviest ink usage of all the prints that I did. Uh, another Cirque du Soleil shot. And yes, did this use a lot of black ink? Yeah, of course it did. Uh, one trick, though, to minimize that. Not a trick, but just a, a tip. In your printer, you generally have a couple of settings as far as the density goes. And there's always one that says like 5600 or 57 something DPI. I generally avoid that setting. It puts down a lot more ink, but I don't find that it really changes the quality of the print. What I would do if you're printing something like this that has a real heavy coverage, what I would do is turn off the high speed printing. Uh, what high speed printing does is it prints in both directions. Your print head prints both ways. Uh, the advantage of that, of course, it's faster. The disadvantage is if it's going a little too quick for your printer, you can get some noticeable lines back and forth. Simply turning that off will generally get rid of it. If you turn off high speed printing, the printer prints in one direction, then the head backs up and it just prints again. So it takes twice as long, but it eliminates those lines if you're getting that. That's something you're going to see more on a gloss paper generally than on something like uh, the gold cotton texture. Uh, but generally, I do almost always turn off high speed printing. And I never use the highest print setting, that 5760 DPI. To me, it just uh, blows through a lot of ink unnecessarily. Let's see. Oh, some, okay. This is a good question. And this is kind of specific with uh, the Epson drivers. Someone asked, do I use profiles or do I print using Epson's advanced black and white controls? That's a really good question. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, there is a, a thing in the Epson drivers called advanced black and white. And what that happens is then the, the printer takes over control. Uh, you can't have Photoshop managing the colors. The printer does it. Uh, the advantage of it is it does have tones built into it. Uh, if you choose advanced black and white printing, you'll see neutral, you'll see uh, warm, cool, and sepia that are built into it. The downside is that you lose control of the tonality. I prefer to use a profile 
for my prints, and I ignored the advanced black and white printing. I did try it as a test, uh, but I found that I, the, the control that I lost wasn't worth it, so uh, I do not use that. Let's see, so someone asked, can I confirm that gold mono silk is really intended for grayscale, not toned monochrome? Um, no, that's not actually the case. Toned monochrome works beautifully on gold mono silk. Uh, I, I prefer generally to print neutral on it, uh, as you can see these prints here. However, toning on it, adding a sepia, selenium, any kind of toning that you might want to do will show up beautifully on this paper. So it's, it's think of it as more of a subdued color paper, but toning will still work. You don't have to just print pure black and white on it. Uh, let's see, there was another one I wanted to ask. Oh, someone asked about the camera effects on printing. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by camera effects. I don't know if you mean uh, those kind of presets that are in your camera. Since my shooting is all raw, those presets kind of go away when it's brought into Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom. What you do need to make sure, however, is that your exposure is as good as possible, particularly when you're printing low-key kind of images, because you want to push your highlights as far to the right as possible without clipping them, because dark tones like this uh, if they're underexposed and you've got some really dark grays in here, they're going to get pretty noisy uh, because there's very little data down on that end of the histogram. So do make sure that you can push as far to the right as possible. You're better off having the mid-tones of your image slightly overexposed if it means putting your whites right to the, to the end and then you can bring down your dark shadows. That's going to give you the best tonal distribution in the image uh, rather than trying to get your blacks right to the left. So the key with landscape, actually for anything on, on these inkjet prints, you want to get your whites very close to the edge, but you don't want to clip them. Okay. I think that's about it for now. I'll, again, for a couple of you asked again about the racetrack. Uh, if you're really interested about the racetrack, it's going to be a little subject for another day. But uh, there's a webinar coming up in just a couple of weeks where I'm going to talk about uh, hiking and traveling with your gear and getting the best exposure and color when you're out in the environment. So stay tuned for that. So going back to silver effects, yes, there are more ways to do that. There are other companies that have these kind of plugins uh, that can do the black and white conversions. Uh, Topaz has one, and On One just came out with a new one that I haven't had a chance to try out yet. So if you're curious, most of these companies offer free trials uh, that, so that you can explore it. So go on their website, Download the trial, give it a try, and see which one that works best for you. Now, before we finish up, let's talk a little bit more about the printers and the printing. Now, it may surprise you, but using those printer profiles I mentioned earlier still play an important part in getting the best black and white print. Profiles don't just translate color from your working space to your printer. They also make sure that the tonal curve translates correctly as well. This helps to ensure that the contrast curve and the fine gradations in your photograph are going to print the best they can. The bottom line is, still make sure you use the correct printer profile for each paper. And for all of these prints that you see here today, I used the free Ilford profiles downloaded from ilford.com. Now, I'd also like to get back to the papers for just a moment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I've been using these five papers as my primary destination for black and white prints. The Gold Cotton Smooth and Textured, my favorites for landscape work. Fine Art Smooth and Textured, like them for portraits that are going to be mounted. And of course, Gold Mono Silk for the times that I've got a really dense, intense, and particularly low-key images, really prefer that paper. For those of you that asked, again, if you prefer a luster finish, you might want to try out Ilford's Gold Fiber Silk. As always, this remains a somewhat subjective choice. So the best advice I can give you is to try out different images. Try out portraits and landscapes, high key and low key, and discover for yourself which surface speaks to you. Ultimately, you should be printing for your own enjoyment and to share what speaks to you with others. When you're producing prints that successfully convey their beauty to you, you're gonna be better able to find an audience and clientele that appreciates your work in artistry. So keep exploring. Keep learning, keep trying this stuff out, and take some pleasure in everything you do. I'll promise to do the same. I'd like to express our thanks to Ilfords for sponsoring this series. Without them, really, we wouldn't be here. So until next time, be well, and I look forward to seeing you all online again soon. Bye-bye.